There are few things quite as British as the pub. Country pubs, city pubs, pubs with food, pubs with canals, even toffs like pubs, or at least they pretend to. In the last couple hundred years, they've been the cornerstone of most communities. In fact, in some places, a pub could be found on nearly every corner of a community. But changing habits within society mean that many have closed down are closing down or are struggling and none more so than the kind of pub I've recently become obsessed with estate pubs not this kind of estate but this kind hideous grim morose dour gross or dangerous there's a lot of ways these places are described by outsiders and not without a bit of truth but there's also something wonderful about these ugly little places Something, dare I say, beautiful about them. Take this one, for example. This is the first one that ever really caught my eye, mostly because of its name. This is the Corner Shop in Beswick, an oddly named, oddly shaped island of 1970s bleak brick architecture that survives an area that has been massively redeveloped in the last 20 years. With a distinctive sloping roof and tiny, pretty pointless windows, the initial reaction is that this is somewhere just waiting to be flattened, but it's still very popular. It survived because it has value to the community. Or oh, this one, the Queen's Hotel over in Collyhurst. This looks like a pub still in swing. It's not pretty, but it is what it is. A place people go to get a drink. And it has many of the features common with estate pubs. A patch of grass nearby, square corners, old brewery style signs, bricks, pebble dashed walls. But this is a pub still in its natural environment. An estate built in the 60s, complete with the tower blocks long associated with this part of Manchester. Modernist, utilitarian, a community designed on top of one of the most industrialized parts of the city. This mural is original and not the type of thing you find these days on modern buildings, let alone on pubs. Not far away is the Clarendon, similar in both design and environment. This mini mini block of flats attached to a long flat rectangle is made even more wonderful by the attached spiral staircase. Seriously, how many pubs look like this? Sure, there's a bit of aging going on and it doesn't try to occupy its street corner with the pomp and ceremony of older pubs in more affluent areas. But like all of the estate pubs, its beauty isn't in its architecture, but in its ability to both blend in and stand out in its environment. It looks odd, but yet it's not out of place. At the end of the Second World War, Manchester, like other big urban centres in Europe, began to look to the future with a new wave of optimism. A sense of collective spirit washed around Britain. This was the era the NHS was born, when people began to realise that for Britain to thrive, everyone needed to look out for one another. 
Post-war urban planners began to envision places like Manchester in a new style very different from row upon row of red brick terraced houses. Instead, the idea was for satellite communities that were self-sufficient, complete with churches, corner shops and local pubs. Fewer long streets, more cul-de-sacs, ginnels and walkways. Inner city estate pubs were at first designed like their countryside equivalents. Homes with little beer gardens and sloping roofs. Flowers outside and carpets inside. Very different to the pubs of the old urban world. Breweries were even invited to take them over and add their own flair. But times changed and modernist, sometimes brutalist influences suddenly appeared. Foreboding cubes, clean concrete lines, sharp edges, grey pebble dash. Not far from the two Collyhurst pubs is the Marble Arch on Rochdale Road. This is what a city pub used to look like. Elaborate, smart. Every chance taken to complicate the design. In contrast, the Clarendon looks like it's half designed, half built and in half the time. The Greyhound in Edgeley, Stockport, was a simple affair. A small community pub in the shadow of some monolithic blocks of flats and blocky masonettes. On the face of it, it wasn't much to look at. But how many pubs have a feature wall of turquoise coloured tiles? How many look both unappealing and inviting at the same time? Today those tiles are gone and the pub is now a house, surrounded by good feelings and cladding. The estate is pretty much the same as it always was though, a testament to the longevity of modernism. But times inevitably continue to change and the futuristic appeal of such architecture very quickly began to look unappealing, old-fashioned. Back to a time when cheap brick buildings or concrete panelled cuboids was all the effort a council would put into a community hub. Regeneration of tired old areas can be translated in many places to mean wiping away the old and starting again. Around the corner shop, that's meant this new estate. In Collyhurst, it means a lot of empty nothing. And the same in Miles Platting, where patches of grass betray the footprints of a once thriving community. The Apollo pub here is nothing special. Relegated to the final stage of its life cycle, it's a derelict shell waiting to be demolished. Built in the era of space race excitement, the pub represented a new, futuristic looking Miles Platting. Gone were the red brick terraces, here were the tower blocks and masonettes. Simple designs, complicated ambitions. Most dreams are destined to die, and the demolition of many of the houses here spelled the end of the Apollo. Its fate is to join an array of estate pubs that have gone and are largely forgotten. Over in Earlham, the architecturally adventurous Tiger Moth might be coming next. Dashing, daring, like a pub that survived an earthquake, the Tiger Moth is a bizarre collection of angles, points and slopes that seem to want to draw the eye upwards towards the sky. There's something confident about it, like a church. It's like a church. Most pubs are. It's still going, the estate is still going. It's a pub living in its natural environment and that's just fine. I like it. The more I look at it, the more I like it. Its Earlham neighbour, the White Lion, hasn't fared so well. Today it's a different type of local. It's a ghost of a building or maybe that's just the whiter shade of pale that covers it from head to toe. Two pubs over in Longsight are fine examples of pubs that survived by adaptation. The Railway Hotel was one of the older pubs built to serve the busy railway yard across the road and the many engineers, drivers, guards and firemen based there. Then the railways were cut down and the pub closed, only to be reopened as a local for the new redeveloped estate. Run by Boddington's, it was another homely example, until it closed soon after. Today, it survives as a shop. Down the road a ways is the Garrett, or was the Garrett, a pub named after the large locomotive works in the area where many patrons would have worked. It's different because the estate it's connected to is over here, to the front. 
whereas to its back remains the old estate, the red brick terraces that were thankfully never demolished in the first place. Still, the 60s saw the decline of the railways and their pubs. Today the building only survives because it's in use as a mosque, which is great, but look elsewhere if you want alcohol. Not all pubs are doomed, some get lucky. Surprisingly, three 20th century modernist pubs survive in Manchester city centre. Survive and thrive. The first is another garret, the old garret. Here there was once an old hall, and not far away, Manchester's first ever mill. Then there was a pub, a grand old establishment built in 1844 that for whatever reason was demolished and replaced. By this, in 1973, another Boddington's pub and a boozer to serve an estate that didn't actually exist. Instead it served anybody who lived or were nearby, mostly students. It did well for anybody though. A typical concrete box with flat roof and dated typography. The city built up around it, got shinier, got wealthier. The pub changed a little too. It's black and white, it's a little chic, it's a little cheap. But it's got a customer base of post-workday drinkers and pre-clubbers, and that's okay. Around the corner is Retro Bar, which you might not notice because it's encased in this rather imposing multi-storey car park. This was once the Swinging Sporran, another bizarre name that would do better if the pub was transported to Glasgow, but still pretty good. This boozer fits in well with the concrete simplicity of the former Umist campus. Over complexity, shrouded in simplicity. It's been retro bar for a while now, a place so retro it's almost historic. Dark bricks and dark corners, cheap pints and expensive parking. The Thompson Arms deeper into the city is another modernist pub with the same features. A simplicity, a flat roof, an embracing of all things dark. Oh, and a multi-storey car park. It's the ugly sister of all the night spots around here. And there's no estate to speak of. Never really was. But it's been lucky, thriving on the edge of the village, thanks to a little bit of colour. A night spot that attracts punters. Only the growing pressure of growing real estate prices threatening to end the party. Will this one day be another hotel? Or a cold apartment block? Or will it end up like this, the Gamecock over in Hume? Stuffed in the middle of strange, bewildering surroundings of new buildings and university overspread. Behind the Gamecock is this large block of flats, renovated several times over the years and still going. The last surviving example of a regeneration that took place in the 1970s and which swept away the old dark terraced Hume and replaced it with concrete streets in the sky, blocks, jagged lines. The pub has the look, sloping roof, dark brick, tight windows. It's a flat roof building crowned with what appears to be a wooden top. It's run down and horrible looking, but it has character. Character won't get you anywhere these days and despite various uses over the years, it's defunct and decrepit. But still, isn't it quite nice? So I guess the question is, why? And the answer is because the regeneration of the mid 20th century swept away poorly built houses and replaced them with more poorly built houses. Because the problems within these communities was more than skin deep. Because to tackle societal inequalities, authorities need to invest in more than just bricks and mortar. Because more people choose to spend their evenings watching TV than going to the pub. Because these days, there are so many more things we have to spend our money on, and so we have less to drink. Within spitting distance of the Apollo in Miles Platting is the Bradford Inn. I went in here years ago because my girlfriend needed a wee. We were greeted by bemused faces and silence. We weren't regulars, so we might as well have been aliens. And we decided it was a rough pub and hot-footed it. But the Bradford is just a pub doing its job. It's a pub attracting locals. Darts, karaoke, sports on TV. It's sort of not far from the city stadium. So on match days, fans park up nearby and head in before the big game. 
After the game, many of them come back for a celebration or a critical analysis. Some probably come for a wee. It's just a pub. These are all just pubs, nothing more. They're brown and gray, black and white. They're concrete and brick rather than stone or terracotta. They're blocky and plain. And frankly, yes, many people find them ugly. But they're a dying breed and dare I say, that makes them symbols of an era. That makes them historic. Thank you.